Hello, I'm Matt from World of Ukes, the North of England's specialist ukulele store. It's my business and I send ukuleles all over the world. And I wanted to talk a little bit today about what I do behind the scenes. So this is what happens between you ordering your ukulele and it arriving with you. Um, something I like to do is make videos. I like to make demo videos. I get excited about new models. And really what I'd love to do all day long is sit here and play lovely ukuleles and uh, demonstrate them for you. But the reality is, in fact, most of my time is spent in my workshop. Um, I haven't done a sort of behind the scenes look in there before, in part because it's often quite a mess. But I've been away for a few days and I've got my colleague Andy to helpfully clear it out and make it a little bit more presentable so I'm I feel confident that uh, if I go in there and show you what I do in there then it won't be as um, untidy as it usually is. Now what I don't want to do with this video is show you how to do it you know so it, this is about my setup process but I don't, I don't want to demonstrate the actual process of, of setting things up. Now um, People have their different ideas about how to do things. And, you know, I've looked at, at videos over, over the years where someone said, oh, this is how I lower the action. And then it's full of comments saying, oh, I don't do it like that. And, um, you know, you shouldn't do this and you shouldn't do that. So I, I don't really want to, to get into the exact nuts and bolts of my setup process, but more I want to sort of show you um, what needs to be done and what I do with an instrument once you've ordered it. So you get a lot of information online about um, this particular brand has a great setup or um, you see influencers saying, you know, this brand always arrives with a low action. Um, and it's that sort of thing which um, gets on my nerves a little bit because I, I don't actually agree with it. And, you know, I will do something with virtually every instrument that goes out. Um, so in terms of the actual process, I'm basically going to back that up with, with the results. I, I get a lot of reviews telling me that the setup on their ukulele is great. And so, you know, I'm, you're just going to have to trust that what I do is correct uh, based on the fact that uh, I have lots and lots of customers who tell me that's the case. Um, but when I'm in the workshop, what, what I'm going to do is go through a sort of typical day um, showing you an instrument that's come in, uh, that's been ordered, and I'll look at that instrument, find out if there's anything I need to do to it, and point out what that is. Then I'll do it and, and I'll show you the sort of before and after rather than the actual process in between. Um, so I will go up to my workshop now and we'll have a look at what I do each day when I wish I could be here playing beautiful ukuleles all day. In fact, I'm getting dusty and dirty in my workshop. So let's, let's go there now. It's not as nice as here. So here I am in my little workshop. I've got plenty of tools here, lots of things that I use regularly, quite a few things that I use from time to time if needed and one or two things which I've yet to come across a need for but um, they just look good in the shop and I thought that will come in handy one day. Uh, one thing that I regularly want to use is this but, but refrain from doing so um, because it can be quite frustrating because a lot of the things that you see and see great reviews of um, can arrive with, with quite a bit of work to do. Most things I would say though are generally playable from the box, you know, if you get a reasonable brand. Um, but playable and nice to play I think are different things. What tends to happen is I'll start and lower the action if I think it needs to do so, so and that often is the case. Um, once you do that you get a, a much nicer play, playing experience but it tends to reveal a few things that might cause some problems, like some raised frets, for example, which cause vibrations or buzzing. Um, so it can be a bit of a, 
a lengthy process to go from um, what is in effect a reasonably playable instrument to something that plays really nicely because of the setup work that's been done. So I'm going to go through some typical orders. I've got some orders that I, I need to, to do, so I'm going to go through those. Um, what tools do I use most often? Um, I use these diamond files um, for uh, little needle files for, for the nut. Um, I, I get through a lot of sandpaper for sanding down saddles, um, my action gauge and my automatic tuner. They're very regularly used. I've got polishes, I've got WD-40, which is quite common to find um, tuners which are a little bit gritty from the factory, so I use those a lot. I've got baking powder, which um, is uh, quite regularly used to refill nut grooves, which are a little bit low, um, together with super glue so I can reshape those those grooves. Um, what else have I got? I've got strap buttons which are regularly used, tuners, um, all sorts of little screwdrivers, loads of different spanners. Spanners which I never use and um, the ones that I do use I really should put somewhere more obvious <laughs> because I tend to go through going no it's not that one, no it's not that one. So it's, it's not a perfectly efficient system. Um, but I've learned over the years, I've gotten a lot better over the years um, at what to do. So I rarely have to send things back. I don't like sending things back, um, even though some, some things are, I think, wrong from, from the beginning, especially baritones with the, the way they, um, when they have a truss rod, often the truss rod's used to lower the action and then you get the, the necks too straight, the strings are resting on the frets. And I think to myself, you know, would I buy, what would I do if I bought this from a, you know, one of the big box shifting companies? It, it, it buzzes from the start. So I, I, don't, I don't really know how these companies get away with it. But, um, you know, partly that's why I want to make this video is because I want to show you what extra goes on behind the scenes, what you don't get from a big box shifting store and um, what potentially you would get if you got it from somewhere which doesn't check it over uh, and the problems you, you'd find. So my first order today is for an UMA UK 05 ST, which is a, a relatively inexpensive 10 ukulele. It's uh, got a solid top. Um, they come in at £119. Pounds. Um, one th benefit of UMA and other brands that are distributed by Stone's Music in the UK is that Mark, who is a good friend of mine and runs that business, he will check everything over first. And he aims for everything to have a reasonable action. So um, if it comes with really high action, he'll have already uh, lowered it. Now, quite often he leaves me a little telltale sign as well of where he's adjusted the nut. Um, you can often find with his instruments, well, things that I bought from him, a little bit of dust on the grooves there where he's adjusted it. Um, but I, I, I'm a little bit like the princess and the pea. I feel like I can, I can detect like a difference in 0.25 millimeters in the string height at the 12th fret. So um, I, I want to, I, I tend to get that reasonable height and, and make it a little bit lower. Uh, this particular one is going to a lady who had talked to me about um, some hand problems she has. I've recommended Uma because I, I find that I can get the, the nut, uh, the action at the nut lower than with other brands without problems. So I thought that would be a, a good fit for her with these problems that she has. So um, I will be lowering the action slightly. Um, another thing I'll do, of course, is to just check that there's no obvious Dents, scratches, marks, flaws. Um, I try to do that beforehand and after because occasionally some of the you know the work that I'm doing, um, you know, so at the very least I can end up with a bit of dust from sanding it down a saddle on. So I try and clean that off. And <laughs> one tool that I forgot to mention earlier, um, this microfiber cloth. Um, uh, oh, harder one, I think. Um, that's been with me for a long time. It's not very pleasant looking, is it? But uh, 
it's been so often used to, to mop up um, lemon oil and dab off WD-40 that it's kind of steeped. It's really quite heavy. Um, I really would like to ca call this something because it's my, it's my, when I'm in here for, you know, upwards of 20 hours a week, often this is my only friend. So if you could name my Ohana rag, that would be kind. Anyway, uh, let's have a look at the action on this one. So we're measuring here at the 12th fret, which is the fret just to the right of the second dot that you can see. And we can see that, that the distance between the bottom of the string and the top of the fret is around about three millimeters. Now I want to get that to 2.5 millimeters or less. Now three millimeters is not wrong. I just want to stress that some people will prefer that kind of height. Um, I try and go generally for 2.5. I, I like to get below three in all circumstances, uh, just because I feel like I can feel the difference. And if I like to play it, then I think when it arrives with the customer, they're more likely to play it. So I'm going to lower that now. So my previously pristine piece of sandpaper is now dusty and I have lowered the saddle and replaced it. So we are now going to double check where we've got to um, with that saddle height. As you can see, I'm, I'm, we're definitely below 2.75 there, so we're sitting on between 2.5 and 2.5 2.25 sorry and 2.5 millimeters so that is now lower so the next thing i'll have to do is check that everything's playing correctly now that i've lowered the action because it can be the case that if there are any issues with this instrument lowering the action will reveal them so we'll do that next so i'm just going to tune that up i use a, an automatic tuner which sends, saves me a lot of time to begin with, just playing around. So, it might be difficult to detect, but I'm just finding on that open G, now that I've lowered the action, that um, it, it's, it's not perfectly clean. Um, so I'm just going to adjust the nut slightly. So what I'm doing is just what I'm doing is just changing the increasing the the break angle. So that's the 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 angle that the string goes over the nut. And it can just be that when you've got something which is not quite clean, just that added downward pressure from that. Um, angle change harder than I would normally. Um, I'm quite a, I suppose, a, quite a delicate player, um, but, but I find that what well, used to be the case many years ago, say 10, 10 years ago, um, when I worked with my family's business and um, my colleague Andy worked there as well, I would find something was perfect and he would go, oh no, it's buzzing, because yeah, big, big thumb would pluck everything really hard. Try to emulate his heavier playing style. T 
to elicit any buzzes if they are going to occur. Um, next, I just want to check the action at the nut. I do have some feeler gauges for this process to, to find out what the, what the action at the nut is, but I tend to do it more by feel um, and sight. So I'm basically just putting down, pushing down at the third fret and just seeing if I can, if there's any gap, noticeable gap between the first fret and the bottom of the string. What you want is a tiny, tiny gap, um, but not a big gap now. So I, I'm using feel and sight, so it, it barely moves. Um, it also feels comfortable. Um, so as I say, Uma, in the UK at least, distributed by Mark Pugh. So he, he if, if that wasn't perfect to begin with, then he probably would have had a go at it and got it sorted. So I'll just basically now just have another look and get it uh, through next door where it will be packed. Um, I'll give it another go. Um, but that's that's a, a relatively straightforward um, bit of work. You know, I, it, it, there's not a lot for me to do. Um, you know, I'll, I'll I'll do some other checks now. I'll just check the intonation's okay, that sort of thing. But you know, it's a relatively standard. Um, process you know not not everything is is going to be difficult which is good because otherwise I'd be in here um, forever and my little friend would get sick of me so we'll move on to the next one so next I've got a flight fireball baritone a very popular model beautiful sound looks great modern yeah really good instrument um, which is very popular um, now I have so far tuned this one up and the first thing I did was check the electrics so it has a pickup so I've plugged that in and given it a go. Um, one of the things I've learnt over the years is to do that first. So many times I've spent half an hour setting an instrument up and then discovered that the, uh, the electrics are completely dead. Now I'm not saying on this model in particular but in, in general oh, I always check the that the pickup actually works because if it's an electrical problem there's not a lot I can do about it so I've done that um, so we've got this one pretty much in tune um, I've, I've checked the action but we'll come to that in a minute so we're getting quite a strong buzz on those first few frets on the G string. Bit of a buzz on the third fret on the B string. And the first fret on the E string. Second fret of the E string. So the fact that these buzzes are coming down at that the lower end um, would suggest to me that it's maybe a fret issue because I've checked the action. You'll have to um, bear with me on this. It's at three millimeters, um, so it's not it's not so low that that's likely to be causing the buzzing. Um, so I'm just going to have a look at the fret work on this one. So what I'm going to use is a fret rocker just to place a lot this straight edge along the fret. So you're basically measuring three at once and you can put some pressure down. Now if that fret is higher then you get a rocking motion. You'll be able to hear and feel where something isn't level. It's got different lengths of sides. So down at this end, you're just wanting to get three. So you'd use the longer side. Up at this end, you'd use the shorter side so that it's only resting on three frets. So you're basically trying to find out if the middle one of the three in each case is high because when you put pressure down, it'll rock back and forth. So 
we're all right on the first three. And but if we get to those three feel okay. But there, here we go. So that fourth fret. If you can hear that tappy noise, that's because that heart fret is higher than the others. So this fret is going to have to come down. I'm going to have to level that off. Um, so I'm going to have to take the string tension down, um, move the mats out of the way, put some tape on and level that fret. Um, I keep talking about my pal, the cloth. Um, the fretboard is a little bit... A little bit dusty, so I'll um, use that to, to clean it up. And it's so steeped with years and years of, of lemon oil that it, it, it's, uh, it'll clean it up nicely. So I'll do that next. <laughs> So we're going to level that off now. Just while I was taking the strings down, the action was three millimeters. I want to get that a little bit lower with a the baritone. They're a little bit more susceptible to buzzing because you've got metal wound strings, you've got those big low notes, and so I'm not going to go quite as low as I did before, but I will be able to lower it a little bit. But first, I've got to take care of this. So the first thing I'll do is file that down and level it off. So I have leveled that fret off, checking throughout the process, so I'll continually come back to it and check with the fret rocker, just to check I don't go too far. But we've now got a position where that fret rocker no longer rocks. So I'll take the tape off, give it another clean. I'm going to, I've removed the saddle as I said, so I'm going to lower that and we'll see if we've got it right when I'm done. So I've now taken the action down. Uh, it's always tricky with wound strings to show it on the, the bottom string there. So I've, you just have to trust me. I'll put an arrow on the screen to show you where it is. So we're just, just under 2.75 there. Um, so that's, a little bit better than it was and I have um, lowered that fret off um, so we'll see if we're now in a position where we're, we've removed the buzzing. So one thing I noticed with this one the neck was a little bit straight um, which just means when it's really straight you can imagine the strings can rest a little bit on the frets you, you need a little bit of a, a little bit of bow in the neck otherwise um you know if it's if it's if you imagine the neck's pointing forwards or perfectly flat then the strings are going to rest on the frets and cause buzzing so i've adjusted the truss rod slightly to take care of that this is what happens every day um stuff 
you know, it starts off relatively neat and then things are in the way. So let's move those out of the way. By the end of the week, everything is on this surface and nothing is hanging up. Um, so we'll just give it a quick tune and see if it's done. So those problem areas are now buzz free. It's a lovely sounding thing. It's important to note that not every example of every product is the same so it's not like oh yes every one of these I have to do this with I had one last or a couple of weeks ago at least um, which I sent out and I just checked everything over and yeah it, it was it was good to go um, but in this case yeah there was a bit of work to do um, so yeah that that is an example where if you'd ordered that from uh, a big box shifting company which I'm often asked to price match with then you'd have had a buzzing problem. Now, um, this customer won't. Um, so I can get that packed up and uh, yeah, you should be happy um, with a buzz free instrument. The next order is um, an unusual one. It's an Ohana SK30L, which is a soprano ukulele body with a tenor neck. I think Ohana sometimes sit around in the boardroom and say, what, we, what can we make that, uh, that people who collect a lot of ukuleles don't have yet? I know, let's put a, a really long neck on a soprano body. Um, this one is a second-hand one, something that's been traded in and somebody's ordered it and they would like a low G on. Uh, checking the action, we're at three millimeters. Um, so I'll lower that and put a low G on. Um, yeah, see how we get on. They want a Fremont low GR, which is a relatively thin gauge low, uh, as low G's go. So she goes in the groove reasonably well already. Just widen it slightly. Won't, I won't lower it just yet. So I'll pop the low G on. keep that because people have a habit of ordering sopranino ukuleles and having a low G fitted which I th think is unusual but that will go back on so I'll pop that in my drawer for later another thing I'd like to do is tidy up this end so I'm going to detune the C string so I can tuck that loose end underneath So 
our strings are sitting a little bit high in the nut, so I'll just lower those a little bit. Also change the brake angle slightly as I'm doing it. Check. Been a bit cautious. We'll check the action at the twelfth. We're sitting at two and a half now. So I'm doing this a little bit faster than I would normally, so I'll check every single fret. Um, I'll look at our fret rocker, I'll check that anyway as a matter of course, um, and just the physical condition. Now I mentioned this one was second hand, um, but it's just to, to show you that um, sometimes things come into me which I've done before. I find makes it a lot easier to attain the standards that I've got because I've done it once already. Uh, this one I don't think it did come, come from me originally, so um, it's just basically to say that if something is second hand, I still give it the same treatment. Obviously, I'm giving you a rapid version of it here, but uh, that is the Ohana SK30L with an OG string, which is pretty much ready to go after a few more checks. The next one is a Carla Contour All Solid Acacia Uke. Um, this is a little bit of one I've prepared earlier, certainly I've, I've had partially there. Um, I think these are really good instruments. The ukuleles are from Carla for a long time have been, um, you know, safe bets, but perhaps not that exciting. But this series, the Contour, they're much more modern, um, much more attractive. Um, but I don't like them with Aquila strings. I don't think they bring the best out of the instrument. You know, they do a series with all solid mahogany, all solid spruce and rosewood, and in this case, all solid acacia. And they, they sound a little bit samey um, with Aquila strings. They sound like, to me, Aquila strings. So um, I have restrung this with a Nui Nui clear water fluorocarbon strings, which I think make it sound better. Um, Acacia is a little bit on the warm side. It's a little bit muted with the the Aquila strings on, and something with slightly more tension really brings it alive. I think so. I've already put those on when it came in. I try and do that. Um, I say I try and do that. I get my colleagues to do that. Um, uh, Jerry or Andy, if they're in, they'll restring things for me, and also so they, that one of them has done that for me. Um, and I've lowered the action to 2.5 millimetres. Now th this is just to get a sort of head start should someone order it. Um, obviously I have to ask permission. Um, is it all right if I send it you without um, the equivalent strings on and with the strings of my choice on? That's what I've done in this case. Um, so I've just, I'm now at the stage of really just double checking things. Um, but I have noticed um, we've got Everything's fine, apart from one. I can't get it now, this is typical. It might be that note. I could hear a slight back. It's gonna be hard to pick up here anyway, but I did notice that we are back to our old friend, the fret rocker. And there we are. It's, it's quite slight, but this fret here is slightly higher than the others. So it's a case of 
filing that down again like we did before. Now, I'll do that now. It, it's really hard to detect that. Now, I think even though the action's been lowered from about 3.25 to 2.5 millimeters, it's really quite hard to elicit a buzz as a result of that. But you know, you never know if someone's gonna try and lower it even further. Um, it might cause problems in the future. So I'd rather do it, even though the chances are the customer probably wouldn't notice that there was any issue there. So we'll get that done. Where's it gone? So here I am making a video, <laughs> having demonstrated the use of the fret rocker and it's completely disappeared. Oh, there we are, it's because I've got stuff everywhere. I haven't gotten far enough, so I'm going to have to retape it. Now, because these frets are the spacing between them, I'm higher up. I can't get a full piece of tape in there, so I can't check it really because the tape on either side is touching the frets, so it doesn't recreate the rock. Well, I suppose I could trim it off, but I thought I'd try it. So back we go again. We're good to go. bit of a shorter um, process not because it was a short process but because I'd done a lot of it previously so I'd lowered the action already I'd lowered the nut already um, and it, you know I just did a quick job so that should an order come in which it has um, I would be ready to go and just do my final run through so that's a Carla Acacia contour series and here's the paperwork. Right, I'll check that over and give it a, a, a proper going over. You don't want to see me going up and down the frets. You can get the idea and I'll have a visual look. Uh, one thing I will do as well is just 
run a cloth in between the slotted headstock because these ones they're often a little bit dusty a little bit of sawdust in there which you know you, you tend to look at the, the headstock and the tuners so I'll just make sure that's all gone anyway that's that one um, in fact I will probably leave it there so I'll go back down to my um, my little studio and uh, conclude things but uh, one thing I've realised is even though I'm only showing you a bit of the process this is slowing me down a lot and I've got quite a few orders to get through so I should probably leave it there um, and I'll speak to you in a second. Okay so that was just a quick look at some of the instruments I've been working on today um, I've just mentioned previously that actually the process of trying to film it does slow things down and it's just the case of um, a one-man business like me I do have help um, but every instrument goes through my hands and my ruined nails uh, from sanding down saddles so um, I really have to to get going so I, I can't I can't film a full day because uh, it's just uh, it takes it slows it down and probably you've seen enough I suspect of me um, working away in my little workshop um, but I think I think it's an interesting thing just to, to show you that there are things that go on and they don't have to be big things you know not everything needs a great amount of work doing so you know there is a bit of a myth about the setup um, you know factory setup is better than it used to be uh, so um, you know things have got better in, in that respect uh, different brands have different sort of quality, quality control levels, I, I guess. Um, you know, like Ahana, you know, you never, you know, hardly ever get a raised fret with an Ahana. Their fret works good, they, they're looked at. Um, stuff from Stones Music, like I suggested. Uh, he deals with a lot of brands like Kiwaya and Uma. Um, uh, you know, they, that is a, it's a good source for me because I have to do less because uh, Mark will have done uh, a lot of what needs doing already and you know I'm I'm doing this um, other people do it too so you know I'm not saying you have it has to be me you know other people are, have, have got um, technicians working on instruments as well but it's it's just a good idea to to buy from somewhere that that will check things over even if nothing needs do it doing um, then at least it's been through someone's hands who's experienced um, I don't think that when you're ordering something online that you if necessarily can't get lucky so you, I'll see this regularly on, on the internet in discussions I ordered X brand from Amazon or from X big box shipping company and it was great now some some of that you can take with a pinch of salt because you know uh, those people are happy with it, what they've got that's that's great but they haven't played as many instruments as I have and they maybe it could be better you know so but there, there is the fact that you can get you can get lucky so I'm not saying you must buy from a specialist but I'm just trying to show you a little bit of what goes on um, that gives a little bit of hopefully added value um, there's been a lot of debate uh, in a couple of years ago um, about a free setup and you know is it possible to do setup work and and for that uh, to be included in the price of your instrument now that there's a key for a start included in the price of your instrument with world of ukes um, you are paying for it you're paying for my time you know i'm managing to to get by and make a living doing this uh if if my my price is up sort of built to to allow me to do that so um you don't get a choice about whether you have it or not i don't have different levels of setup i don't sort of, i don't really don't really buy into that i mean i think something that either plays nicely and is right or it doesn't um and i i couldn't send something out without doing it so you know i, I that setup it kind of it's intrinsic to what i do because i i I could, if if you don't pay if if you have a a paid setup and you don't take that option that means 
you know, if we looked at the things we've see, seen today, that would mean me sending those out with issues. Now, I, I'm just not comfortable to do that, but it does mean that I spend a lot of time in that workshop. And, you know, it does mean that my time has to be paid for in with the price of the instrument. So it does mean that if you're asking me to price match someone who doesn't do that work, I, I, I always say no. And it's not because I'm mean or because I'm making loads of money and I drive a Ferrari. It just allows me the time to do that work um, and make sure it's right. And that's more important to me than, you know, trying to get the sale, you know, oh, yeah, okay, I'll drop the price by 10% to match a big big box shifter. You know, it's, it's just not something I could do. But, um, you know, if, if people often, if they ask, they'll often accept that. Uh, if they don't, hopefully now they'll realise it, it wasn't just, you know, me being tight, you know. Anyway, so that's a look at the workshop process. Just a little look. No, I, I didn't do, I didn't show you every process that I do and I didn't show it in great detail. I, I, you know, I'm just trying to give you an illustration. You know, if I'd have shown you what I do with each ukulele, you know, looking at every part of it and checking every fret and, you know, it would have been there all day. Uh, so, which is pretty much where I am, but you don't want to watch it. Um, so it was just a little insight. I hope you, you found it useful and uh, thank you very much for watching. Uh, thank you for supporting World of Use. Um, I'm recording this today on the, the store's eighth birthday. I've been selling Ukes for 15 years nearly and um, eight years of my own World of Ukes store. I really appreciate the people who shop with me because they've kept me going all this time so thank you very much and thanks for watching see you again soon world of uke.co.uk world of uke.co.uk